Hey everyone, welcome to the Thinking Podcast. This is Jeff Wu. And I'm Michael Brandt. It's been great having a conversation and a dialogue with all of you. Keep up the questions, the commentary, the feedback. It's, it's honestly been a lot of fun. Yeah. Today we're talking about Axiom 4, that human enhancement is inevitable. And I think that when we talk about enhancement, people are scared or, or have these concerns of unnaturalness. Are you going to be like this weird androgynous android thing in the future? Uh, and it's a little bit scary. I think change is scary. And a big part of today's episode is talking about why it's not scary, why it's not unnatural, and frankly, why it's going to be inevitable. So let's get comfortable with that fact and embrace it and do it in the most responsible, safest way possible. Yeah, there's, there's lots to talk about there about the considerations, how it might look, and just in general, one, one narrative I like a lot is that the human as a participant in their own evolution, that's something unique that we're able to do because we're conscious, sentient things. We've always participated in our own evolution. But let's look at the historical context. Let's look at how things might be playing out in the future. But first, I think it'd be helpful just to establish kind of the ground rules. Like, what is the system of, of thought around... Enhancement. enhancement. What, yeah. are, what are the, what are the, how should we think about this space? And one thing that we've coined uh, in thinking about it here at Nutribox is this notion of there's three degrees of enhancement. So there's zeroth degree, first degree, and second degree. And let's start with second degree. Second degree is the type of enhancement that we are probably most familiar with. It's things like food, supplements, uh, it's things, it's eyeglasses, it's things that we put on or or into our current existing systems of I.O., so our, our, our senses that we already have, things that we put into through our body through those senses, through our digestive system or into our eyes, uh, that helps us be better. That's what we think of as second degree enhancements. First degree enhancements starts going towards implants. That's things that you put into your body, a uh, pacemaker, something that, that goes into your body that, af that affects your body. So LASIK would be another example of this. Things that kind of break the barrier that, uh, that are part of us, maybe replacing an organ function or augmenting an organ function. And then zeroth degree enhancements, those are the things that actually change who we are. So that would be something on the DNA or the cellular level that's meaningfully rewriting who we are as a person. So as we're thinking about the space presently and going forward, we, again, we think about second degree things. So things that we put uh, like foods and supplements and then first degree things that we install into our body and then zeroth degree things that change who we are fundamentally. And we found that this is a good framework for how to think about enhancement indefinitely. Um, and that basically any type of enhancement, we can bucket into these areas and, and discuss it. Yeah, no, I think you mentioned in, in, in one of the sections, the term IO. And I think, you know, when we talk about systems, uh, the, the computer system knowledge is a great one. And IO in, in computer systems is this notion of input and output. Um, and, you know, as, as we've talked about before, you know, any sort of interactions into the system generate some sort of output. And I think, especially for how we categorize this framework of, of enhancements, it's a useful metaphor to use. And in, in sort of keeping with that analogy, another way to put you know, what we've been talking about, what Michael just introduced is second degree, second degree enhancements is using existing channels, right? Existing senses of what humans are fundamentally already using to process the world, right? So like eating things. Right, eating things, that, like basically using like the digestive system, using our eyesight, using our hearing, right? Uh, you know, directly manipulating at that existing input output level. Then if you keep going down that analogy, then the first degree enhancement is sort of, yeah, replacing or adding new uh, IO channels at the organ level. So it's like, you know, adding a floppy disk, you could be adding a DVD drive. So that's, you know, in a human term, like, hey, we're gonna add uh, a pacemaker to, you know, to improve or, or basically fix your heart. Yeah, and I think there's other examples of these. For instance, right. uh, IUD that's installed for birth control. I think it's a great example of currently existing first right. degree enhancement. enhancement. And then the zero degree, the, the term I like to use is like meta IO, right? You're basically hijacking the existing input output channels to create new forms of input and output, right? Like, as Michael mentioned, like direct DNA manipulation, right? So now you could create, 
using existing protein folding and, and the systems of how like we grow new organs to create you know functionally completely novel organs with our own systems today yeah so I or think, you could imagine for instance cells that are somehow connected to a network right so right. so you could have cells that are in your body that are smarter than your right. natural cells that are connected to the internet or connected right. to some device so they're able to act intelligently and and that exactly. would be, that, that's so, like so, materially, that's right. a zeroth order thing. Right. So it's like affecting things on a cellular level or intracellular level that with a zeroth degree. First degree would be like acting at an organ level or adding new organ level features. And then second degree is like using existing organs and sort of using those existing channels. Right. So hopefully that's like a clear way to, you know, for us to talk about and, and, and discuss enhancement in a very organized and thoughtful way. But before we dive like too deep into you know, our theories of how these dif different degrees of enhancement are going to unfold and what are some interesting examples there. Let's talk about the historical uh, case for enhancement. Let's talk about some of the objections of enhancement. Because I think for a lot of listeners out there, I think, you know, a lot of us will be like, yeah, we're totally on board. Let's, 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 we're gung ho. Let's, let's go enhance ourselves like crazy. But, you know, we're in a country, in a society, in a civilization where it's still like very little technology shy or technology adverse. So, you know, let's, let's talk about the historical case first and, and address it from a, sort of a fundamental, why this is a very human thing to, to start thinking about and doing. Yeah, I, in general, we've seen humans again and again look at ways to enhance themselves, to use technology, to ma manipulate the world and also manipulate themselves. And it's, it's part of what makes us fundamentally human is that ability to do that type of thing. So from antibiotics to eyeglasses to telescopes, like we, ha we have all these things that we do. Uh, I mean, for a long time, people have been eating different substances to affect their mental state. People have, we've been putting things into our body to do, to have desired effects for a long time. We've been doing second order, second, we've been doing second degree enhancements for a long time. Basically since we've it, first like rose up from sort of lower animals right? right like tools right we're extending our existing muscles to do additional like you know with higher leverage right we have like you know spears to like extend out our our like the reach of our arms essentially yeah and i think that a lot of the fundamental reason why it stayed at second degree isn't for any particular ethical or or moral reason like obviously we want to enhance ourselves it's just that our technology has not been such that we can affect things more deeply, right? Like we haven't been able to do effective, reliable surgery. Surgery is very invasive. If you're gonna have something installed, it should really work, right? If you're gonna have, like, we haven't been in a spot where we're able to regularly affect things at the cellular level. Yeah, I think when it's for was want... surgery even like first invented, right? Like people were <laughs> not even washing their hands, I think. In, in like the 1860s, right. yeah. People were, didn't even know you had to wash your hands. So, yeah. Um, things like pacemakers or like artificial hip those are those are really as like on an as needed basis as a, for to treat something that's wrong uh, and i think as we're getting more and more experience and as new industries are opening up i think we're going to see more of that and my one big question i have about enhancement in general is whether it's really going to come from the the medical industry like the me the medical profession or whether it's going to come from other professions like technology technology because like there's a big notion and those of you who have doctor friends are familiar like, there's a big notion among doctors this this notion of do no harm like you're there to treat things you're not necessarily there to to install cool new devices into people you're there to treat them yeah. when they have diseases you're there to treat the patient but but then there first of all there are doctors who do who are game to do enhancements and doctors in general are the ones who tend to to have the most knowledge on how t these things right. would take place. But then there's also that fundamental thing of like, hey, like, is this Hippocratic really? oath. Yeah. But I think that's st it's still very medieval, right? Because I think that in when, you know, Hip no, Hippocrates, like, I think came up with that, that notion, medicine was still very heuristic and almost superstitious, right? So like the fact that like you could just actually mess someone up was, was very real. For our understanding now, around some of these systems are a lot more robust, right? We can now manipulate things in the positive direction with, with very little negative side effects, right? Right. So I think it's like, let's update, you know, why is Hippocrates like what, you know, this guy in, you know, 
1000 BC. That's, I, I'm, I'm just curious, like when did he come into, yeah, he was born in 460 BC, right? Like why is someone that's 2500, you know, years old, why is that philosophy still hold true today, right? Like as, as innovators, as people that are constantly re-examining assumptions, that's like a very basic assumption. It's like, hey, like obviously we want to do no harm, um, but I think the more nuanced approach is, you know, let's look at the risk reward, you know, ratio. And if, if the risk is something that we fully understand and can and, and can bake into the into the thinking, and the rewards are big enough, then it's worth the risk to be taken, right? Yeah. If there's no risk to be taken, we're gonna be, you know, no one would have sailed across the Pacific Ocean, right? Right. Yeah. No, no progress would be made. I think I think something like LASIK really makes the case for this type of thing. Like I think it's something where I think it's we've, great. Yeah. we've seen it develop, we've seen it mature, we've seen the price come down. We can talk about that more too. Just uh, the democratization of, of technologies uh, where one worries that as we have new enhancements that they'll only be available to like super wealthy people and we'll, we'll see an increase like stratification where like wealthy we'll have like white wealthy superhumans and then everyone else who's not as wealthy won't be able to afford it i think lasik has shown the opposite where right. it started out like any new technology like new iphone or whatever it started out as something that a minority of early adopters could afford and then as it as it became more mature right as the ways of doing it became cheaper um as access became more widely available the price came down naturally and so now LASIK is, is within striking distance for a lot of people's budgets. Um, and I, my, my question is, why aren't there 10 other things like LASIK? That's cool for your eyes. Um, why aren't there 10 other things? Why isn't there a menu of things? I think it's a great example. And there's always going to be some risk with like doing surgery on your retina, right? But it's a risk reward ratio that a risk people, with people, a car, yeah, like that that. people are comfortable <laughs> with, right? Like if there's like do no harm, right? Someone with like 200, you know, 20, 20, 200 eyesight is in the, like wearing eyeglasses is fine, but I'm going to give you like a point, you know, a point zero one percent chance of blinding you. If you're strictly following the Hippocratic oath, right? You'd be like, no, like I'm going to potentially might do a little bit of harm. Right. So I think people are already like, you know, loosening their, you know, ties to, to like this, this oath. Right. Um, and one thing, one thing that I think we're also seeing in another, another phrase that we've coined here at Nutribox is that we're in this general age of Fitbit and, and that's this notion of we're seeing everyone wearing computing devices. We're seeing a lot of people, a lot of companies are entering this health and enhancement space that are not typical like health companies. We're seeing a lot of companies that, for instance, are helping you track your sleep or measure your heart rate. Um, and it's not com it's not your doctor or your hospital telling you to do it. It's a th it's a thingy that you buy at Best Buy or on Amazon. So there's there's these other companies that are building these pieces, and a, and a lot of what we're seeing right now is still like uh, second degree enhancement. But we're seeing companies that are creating second degree enhancement a little outside of like it, you're not visiting the doctor in order to get an uh, Apple Watch. You you just go and, and right. get it. Um, you don't have to get a doctor's prescription to get 23 and me done. So there's this there's this bubbling up of products that are getting consumers health, super, wellness related, yeah. enhancement related that aren't prescribed by doctors. Yeah, I, I think the, I think the healthcare system is is broken. It's going to have to change, right? I think we're just talking about this this weekend, where the incentive structure with healthcare in general is is very screwed up with like insurance companies with big pharma with yeah. hospital systems with like the doctors and some themselves right where they're incentivized to just churn through patients where you're treating the symptom of the patient themselves right like i think we've all been felt like a little bit like cattle when we're just like all right like we're jamming through this the doctor's just like psh, 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 all right here's your meds bye like yeah yeah i I, remember, I just you know was on another radio show uh yesterday afternoon and i was talking to um People were calling it, you know, it was a hip hop show, very salt of the earth audience, um, very much different from like the typical people that we talk to in Silicon Valley. And it, yeah, it just seemed like, like, you know, people were struggling with, you know, opiate addiction to, hey, I have PTSD, I'm a 19 year, year vet, military veteran, I have one more year to get out to, so I can retire, and I wanna be normal. I wanna be able to like not wake up in the middle of the night and like be scared that someone's breaking in to, you know, people that had like, 
sisters or parents that were you know approaching dementia or coming out of coming out of comas and it was just like kind of crazy that they were like asking me about these questions and it just i think just highlighted that like these people just probably didn't have access or just no even know how to engage properly with doctors right um i think there's but I, I, on the flip side i think there's a lot of like doctors and, and doctors in training who are very you know proactive here with preventative health care which i think is like part of like this notion of enhancement right like pre-treating symptoms pre-treating diseases and i think the pre-treatment start is like is, is a way to sort of back into enhancement like you're pre-treating alzheimer's can that kind of mean like like brain enhancement if you're pre-treating muscle dystrophy does that mean like hey we're gonna like increase your strength yeah if you're pre-treating cardiac arrest are you helping someone exercise and eat healthy right earlier in life exactly um, and I think I think part of it I think honestly what's happening is that as more things are being figured out in this causal long-term relationship where uh, the things you do earlier in life or, or certain genetic markers combined with things that you do are shown to have very predictable effects later in life then this notion of pretreatment it's like hey you know, this person has 23 and me, and we know their lifestyle. It's very likely that XYZ is going to happen to them later. Let's pre-treat and like, yeah, let's install something to this person, this healthy 25 year old that's going to help them regulate. Cause guess what? There's a 90% chance that when they're 65, they're going to have XYZ condition if we don't. And as we're getting a better understanding of those things, the notion of like, of pre-treatment versus enhancement versus yeah. enhance, it's going to, it's going to blur a bit. I think that, uh, Things are going to seem like a lot. They're going to be rock solid cases for why you should be yeah. doing these things. Um, I think. I think some of the other questions that we were brainstorming that that people have around enhancement are. I think one just really basic question is, hey, like why when we get into like first and zero order things, what happens if if this goes obsolete? Like, I th in general, if my I replace my phone every couple of years, or I replace my eyeglasses. You're telling me you're going to implant something into me? What do I do when like version three comes out? Like, right. like what do we? How do we deal with obsolescence in this world? I think that's maybe something that that people are. I scared think technologists will have to solve, right? I think that, you know, I think in the future with some of these technologies, right? Like, yeah, I don't want you know version one of you know an implant. I don't want some clunky like <laughs> thing in in my in my wrist. Yeah, I think to truly be mass adopted, I think uh, companies and products will have to make it easily updatable uh, hardware or things that just naturally deprecate out. Right? You can imagine a future where we have nanobots that are injected into your bloodstream that you know interact directly with your your neurons or interact directly with your organs. I don't want no one wants obsolete stuff, but like that could be baked into the technology. Yeah. Some planned, so, yeah. planned obsolescence. Right. So one one other question that people have is, okay, what if we're, what if we're overly dependent on these things? This notion of, hey, if if we're being propped up by a bunch of different technologies, then uh, we're not very strong. Like, right. and, and if that power goes out, then we're weaker than if we just develop their natural selves. Like, how do we? You can like. Yeah, I think that's a great dependent. question. I think it's you could say that about humanity today. If I didn't have, you know, we didn't have our power, we didn't have our iPhones, we didn't have our cars, we're kind of fucked, right? right? Like, I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to survive, you know, yeah. hunting, gathering. There's a lot of systems that we're already dependent on, and right. I think it's very, very easy. It's, a, it's an extremely common fallacy to to think that life right now today is, like, natural or something. Right. Like, you realize, like, if, if trucks stopped coming into your city, if, like, if they stop replenishing the Your Safeway or the Walgreens, <laughs> like that would go out of stock in like two days. Like if they stop, if like the water system didn't work, if the electricity system didn't work, like yeah. we're so dependent. Where are you gonna get your water exactly? We're so dependent on systems. I'm not saying this like a. I, I'm I'm not scared. I think it's actually really nice. It's it's elegant the way that civilization has organized itself and like that these systems do work. Right. Uh, I think it's really cool. Uh, but I think we should just recognize that we're standing on the shoulders of giants and it, as other things are coming in, like we'll be dependent on those two and that's okay. Yeah. I think what it really comes down to is, it, is how comfortable we feel relying on these things. Like basically what's the uptime? Like if what, again, it's a technology problem because engineering problem, it's an engineering yeah. problem because once things are really 
really performant, once things just don't go down rarely or there's backup systems, then it's okay. Like the water system works, right? So it's like, we're not like afraid of being dependent on like government water, water power, or something. Yeah, right, government internet, power. Wi-Fi, yeah. It's like your, your power goes out, I don't know, you know, like less than 10 days a year. That's even a lot. Like I, I think it's been zero days in the last year. So it's like that when that stuff just works. Yeah, I think basically these things will be utilities yeah. where they'll just be constantly available there probably will be some regulation if it gets to the point to make it, you know, to, to mandate sort of pricing and, and sort of, you know, how, how these things can be charged so that access is fair and, and equally distributed. Yeah, so I think, yeah, exactly. I think if enhancements are to the point where it's a utility, then yeah, we'll, we'll think of them like electricity or water I think there's for this, ourselves. I think there's this myth of the pure human. Yeah. This myth that, like, that we're there's humans and then like this future stuff we do is playing god it's like a lot of what we're doing is already playing god by the by that way of thinking yeah um, yeah so i mean i think i think we cover a lot of objections i mean let's talk about sort of exciting things happening in you know as sort of defined by our, our three categories of enhancements um i think you know, obviously, Nutribox today is sort of leading the cutting edge of second degree enhancement, right? Yeah. Like bringing together the most scientifically validated supplements and in- consumables and putting them into very, you know, quality controlled, heavy metal tested, et cetera, uh, uh, nootropic stacks. Um, what else do you think is interesting in the sort of second degree enhancement category? I think, you know, our friends at Swami are doing interesting things there with like really re examining what kind of foods we can be consuming. Um, I guess intermittent fasting is one thing that you know, we're you know, huge proponents of that it would be considered a secondary enhancement, right? Like that's controlling the regimens of what we consume in order to, you know, using that existing channel to, to optimize sort of internal uh, functions of, you know, insulin sensitivity, you know, upregulating longevity genes like CERT1, CERT2 to increase potential, you know, health span and lifespan for ourselves. Uh, you know, using that existing channel to increase adult neurogenesis. Um, what else? I mean, it's also just like, just, yeah, let's like, you know, hey, we're going to be thoughtful of how we exercise. Like we're using existing, again, inputs into our regimens. Like we're going to do a lot of bench press. We're going to like, we want to use that existing channel to increase our pectoral muscles. Yeah. Um, or, you know, we're going to run a lot to increase our heart, you know, heart health. Um, I think things like meditation, I think a lot of like the things that, that again, that we do to our body, like the, the context we put our body into, I think listening to a certain type of music, I think there's, there's things that we do that are meant to affect our system. Yeah, have you meditated? That's something that I've been trying to incorporate into my regimen, but it's something that's hard because like, you know, it's, I'm being interrupted all the time with just requests, but I'm not, I don't know. I, we, I, we, I should, like, we should have I'm like a medication like, yeah, I'm not month med- and systematize it. <laughs> I've not meditated with a capital M. Like I, I definitely get my own like time to chill and cool off. It's like very restorative. Like I definitely, I, yeah, I do my own things that, or I feel like I let, I give my mind a break and do, I don't know. I'm not like trained as a meditator, right. um, but I feel like I do something like that. And and it's no, very I, important. I think there's folks out there that are listening. Yeah, like, love to hear your feedback on meditation. And that might be something that we want to, you know, quantify and, and do our approach of quantifying it and, and see how that could potentially fit into, you know, a biohackers regimen. Um, I mean, I think, you know, this is the most understandable form of enhancement, second degree enhancements. Yeah. Um, first degree enhancements, uh, these are you know basically adding you know or implanting uh devices or organ transplants etc into uh our bodies as a way to uh basically add like organ level functions to 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 our to our body um one question i have for for any parents that are listening is would you install gps in your kid like when your kid (laughs) is born would you install some chip that just it pretend it, it expires when they're 18 um, and you just know where they are it, it can be found out where they are um, if something bad happens to them if they're lost if they're whatever that you just you and it's painless it's like it's completely unobtrusive 
I could imagine something like that. If your doctor just offers that as an option, I feel I like a lot, lot of parents people would, would, be, would, be, would be down for it. I think the concern, only, you know, the main concern for me is, hey, I don't necessarily want this thing to be hacked. I don't want to be stalked by the government or anyone else. Um, but I think there's a lot of, you know, you know, encryption, you know, can do a lot of help there, right? If you have just strong encryption where there's no backdoors and, and all of that to, to break you know, reporting of my GPS location. But yeah, I, I think that doesn't sound crazy. I, again, I think there's already degenerate cases of that existing today. Like there's like, you know, actually my first company was like, you know, GPS tracking for your friends on, on a map, right? It's called the glass map. And there were other similar products out there at the time tracking your kids, like, you know, Life360 or, or Family Tracker type apps where it's like, yeah, my, my kid is walking home from school. Like, oh, I feel good that, you know, he's safe and, and on his way. Right. So I think the, the, the desire is already there and it's, it's a, it's a crappier version of that. Right. Imagine if it's like always on, it doesn't like kill your phone's battery. Yeah. Your kid can't like force quit the tracking app when he's like sneaking out the, you know, to, to, to do something. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see that. I think that part of the, uh, part of the challenge is just like a creative challenge or a, a sense of, what are the killer features? And I think that it's going to be actually something really just simple and novel that ends up getting a lot of people's attention. There's right. going to be a, a killer feature that everyone just starts saying, hey, yeah, like that's, there's going to be something like the next LASIK or the, like something else that's a first degree enhancement that's just going to catch on yeah. like crazy. And it's going to be, it's going to become affordable and it's going to become something that everyone wants yeah i mean i think also just bring it to more like a cultural reference i think uh trans you know changing sex is, is like a very uh salient topic with you know caitlin jenner where you can it's very i think it's a it's very just lot you know rational to be like hey that kind of implant or, or surgery is a lot more intrusive than like some of the things we're, we're talking for about, sure right it's like well you're literally like changing you know a penis to like a vagina and and all the different hormones that are injected during that process so i think it's like if yeah. that's socially acceptable which i think it's great people again going back to that diversity point right you get to be more of who you want to be right i think that's like uh you know another data point in that direction and people are okay there are early adopters or people that are more brave to like go undergo some of these like intense surgeries and, and implants um that you know i think we're in a, in a very natural shot to you know some of these other first degree enhancements that we're talking about i'm curious to know or just to talk a bit about for zeroth degree enhancements one of the things that comes to mind is crispr the ability to just to edit genes and insert different genetic information the reason it's important that dna is so important is because dna contains the the set of instructions for how to build stuff so like that in order to make a make a protein or make an organ even like there has to be some pattern in your dna that allows that to happen and once something is set into your dna it also tends to cause that thing to happen so it's it's by editing someone's dna you set a uh, cascading series of effects where special types of proteins are created, special processes are begun, um, and and your entire biology system changes when your DNA changes, which is why everyone talks about DNA and this idea of, of editing DNA is, is so inter interesting. Yeah, I mean, and DNA is like, it, yeah, it's like zero because like, in a way, you know, like your DNA fingerprint is like a unique identifier for you. Right. And we're going to be able to manipulate that i mean we're starting to manipulate that i think there's a uh there is a chinese crispr trial on human uh on humans already right. undergoing so i think it's and i think there's also just therapeutics for like crispr to treat certain cancers so i think uh we're already starting to manipulate our dna yeah and and this really starts to make sense to to, to think of as zeroth degree because it's it doesn't go closer in than this there's no there's no further direction to go once you're affecting someone's dna that's as close to the heart of 
of how you would change code. a person. Yeah, source right. code. It's like there's nothing more like fundamental to who right. to what you, you are. You can install apps. You can like talk into the microphone of your iPhone. You can install apps into your iPhone. This is like changing the circuit. like the heart. Yeah, this is like the circuit, and this is like the yeah. This is like iOS. This is like hey, everything. There's no yeah. There's no more fundamental. Uh, block before that and i think this is it's exciting because i when we think about second order stuff in this context it seems almost old school like even it, it seems like brute force like the best ways that we currently have of affecting our system are to put things in through our our sensory organs or to to eat things to hear things to watch things um compare that with the elegance of of something that's implanted or or uh meaningful change at the genetic level uh it seems in in a lot of ways much more succinct much more direct if you can if you can directly affect someone's a a trait about someone so a predilection for certain disease uh, then then that would be a lot more elegant than feeding someone a diet that would help them to avoid that disease for instance or feeding them drugs that would affect your whole body and one of the things that they might do might be to some affect that disease. Effect, yeah. Not to mention like the twelve other side effects. Right. I mean, I think CRISPR is one interesting example. Um, other interesting examples of what you know, other zero degree enhancements would would be perhaps symbiotic nanobots. Yeah. Right. Can you start injecting and planting uh, synthetic neurons that you know link and talk directly to your neurons in your brain, right? So it's like interacting at a cellular level. And it's like, again, changing sort of the fabric of who you are. Yeah. I think one interesting, you know, trivia point is that our bodies have 10 times more bacteria cells, foreign cells than actual human DNA. Yeah. And the number of genes, uh, human genes are 1% of like what's in, in our bodies. Like Whoa. there's 99% of your genes are like bacteria genes and, and, and other things. Yeah. Um, so even the notion that like that you know I'm 100 percent human it's not it's already not true right we're, we're like already... a symbiote with our gut microbiome there's yeah. you know, 2012 I think an interesting r- research paper that basically said hey your mu- gut microbiome is essentially like another organ yeah like it, it's super interesting right like these the, these bacteria in your in your digestive system that like break down you know, fibers produce vitamins produce enzymes produce neurotransmitters they're, yeah they're like another organ essentially um and can you imagine now in the future where uh we have like symbiotic probiotics that like are programmed like like to perhaps hey there's like interesting data that show that certain microbiomes can affect like anxiety affect certain performance so what if like you have a completely programmable uh gut microbiome that is like hey when you're doing athletic competition let's let's focus on like characteristics that enhance physical performance and if we're like producing intellectual work let's focus on a microbiome mix that is optimized for you know long steady focused mental states yeah um so i think it's like another and i think this is a perfect example of a zero order enhancement because it's tying directly plugging into your existing body at a at a at a cellular like you know fabric level yeah yeah it's exciting i think that we're at the cusp of something really big i think that when we think about enhancement over time and humans and our participation in our own evolution it's something that we've seen as progress happen throughout all of history and i think we're at this really exciting point where the cost of computing is going down, the total number of people, we talked about this a bit in our last episode, the total number of people who are thinking about solving problems like this is orders of magnitude bigger than it's ever been before. So I think we're at a real growth point where we've, historically we've always enhanced ourselves, especially with uh, with second degree enhancements and some first degree enhancements. And I think we're just gonna see a total uptick, like hockey stick growth. Second, first, zero degree, all being enabled. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know, that's why I think we're here yep. talking, looking, well, being at the I, forefront of this space. I, I know, I know personally, all like, of us here are probably at, you know, at the top 1% of the world, because if you're even listening to us right now, 
you're open to these ideas, you're help, you're, you're thinking about these ideas, which I think yeah. more of us should be doing. I guess one personal story to wrap up is, is I know what, a lot of what's motivated me to be in this space is just since being a kid and seeing PCs become a thing and seeing the internet become a thing, like this all kind of happened within my lifetime. And, and then seeing mobile phones become a thing. And I actually had the good fortune of working at YouTube. I worked at YouTube for a year and it was really cool. YouTube is one of the coolest companies that exists. It exists, but I always had this feeling like I was there kind of after the big bang of YouTube. Like it was really cool to go from the world, not having like a reliable way of putting videos on the internet to having something where like, you know, 80 hours or I don't know what they're at, 120 hours of footage are uploaded every minute. Like that paradigm shift that took place, we, I, I've personally seen these paradigm shifts take place again and again and again, where we go from like, no one has a smartphone to everyone has a smartphone. Uh, and I think we forget those things so quickly. It's just, okay, we're in a world where everyone has smartphones, but I think that's very motivating to me to, to be here figuring out what's the next big paradigm shift. What's the best, what's the next big like mass scale change in behavior as it relates to technology that's about to take place. Uh, people talk about drones, people talk about Bitcoin, people talk about VR, AR. I think there's all these kind of hot topics. I think that the particular space I mean, the that we're in is human. Yeah, investment. I think I, 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 well, just think about it from a macro scale, about it. like from a historical scale, like, like, the, if, like looking at epochs, right? I don't think that I think some of these innovations will will blend away into like smaller paradigms in, in a larger trend. I yeah. think human enhancement is right. one of those like big things. Yeah, that, like, like computing define, or yeah, yeah, that find like, hey, bef there were before computers, after computers, right? And there'll be before human enhancement and after human enhancement. Yep. Like you, you won't have that for like drones. I yeah, I think so. I think I think it's just one of the most exciting areas to be in. I think, it's, I think it's really cool from a tech perspective, from a society perspective. Um, and it's, yeah, it's cool to be affecting that. Cool. Yeah. That was a great wrapping, uh, story there. Um, so as always follow us on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes, and we always appreciate your feedback, your comments, keep them coming. Uh, it, you know, it's fun for us and hopefully fun for you. Thanks.